Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge our Indigenous uh, country men and women who actually have uh, had the, the concept of women's business uh, for around 60,000 years. So uh, I think I uh, very much could learn a lot from them. So RMIT University acknowledges the people of Woiwurrung and Boomerang language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT University respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders, past, present and emerging, and including those who are studying here at RMIT. RMIT also acknowledges the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia where it conducts its business. The place we meet tonight has a long history of suffrage rallies and feminist debates for women's rights for equality. The patent tiles that uh, you'd see at the entrance on the outsides of the building have impressions of ruffles, keys and suspender belts to represent the suffragettes who once occupied the original hall. During World War I, the building was leased to a feminist organisation who hoisted a white, purple and green flag on the roof as a symbol of the sisterhood of women. And as you can see, echoes of purple and green still here today. Here at RMIT, we've come a significant way in, in balancing our workplace for the better over the past few years. In 2016, we committed to the Gender Equality Action Plan, a strategy that holds us accountable to becoming an employer of choice for women and improving the staff experience in a meaningful and authentic way. I'm very proud to say that earlier this year, we were recognised as an employer of choice for gender equality by the Workplace Gender Equality Agency for the second year consecutive year, an award that focuses on pay equity, support for parents and carers, mainstreaming flexibility, preventing gender-based discrimination and promoting the career advancement of women. I'm also proud to share that RMIT has recently been recognised as Employer of the Year at the LGBTI Inclusion Awards where we also received the Trans and Gender Diverse Inclusion Award as well as recognition as a gold employer. <coughs> as an employer of choice, RMIT is committed to continuing progress in each of these areas and po that positively impact all the staff. Because people of all genders benefit from gender equality, which is why we're very proud to hold this event here tonight. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our panel. Libby Lyons, it, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Um, she, Libby serves as the Director of Australia's Workplace Gender Equality Agency, WGIA, commencing only a few months after the agency recognised RMIT as an employer of choice. <laughs> I'm sure that's not a coincidence. <laughs> Um, the, the agency eloquently defines um, gender equality in this context. <clears throat> this, where it, it's as a workforce where the skills and ambitions of employees are equally recognised and reward, rewarded regardless of gender. <clears throat> the agency is forged its place as a world leading agency in gender equality and, and data collection and analysis and Libby has reported on these data insights at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. For her contribution to the pursuit of gender equality, Libby has been recognised as one of Apolitical's 100 most influential people working in gender policy in both 2018 and 2019. She's an ambassador for Honour a Woman, which is helping to ensure that women are recognised in nominations of Australian honours and is indeed successfully moving us towards a 50-50 balance. We're especially proud to welcome Libby to our RMIT University campus in light of the fact we've recently received our citation as an equal opportunity employer, as I mentioned before. On that very positive note, please welcome Libby. <laughs> Next, I'd like to welcome Professor Gillian Whitehouse. Gillian has joined us all the way from Brisbane this evening, where she's a professor in the School of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Queensland. Gillian's research specialises in gender and employment equity issues, including the impact of regulatory frameworks and legislative change, pay equity cases, parental entitlements, and work-family balance. Her work has informed pay equity inquiries and the development of a parental leave policy in Australia. She's currently part of the consortium undertaking an evaluation of Australia's paid leave, parental leave policy, 
Her research has attracted significant funding, including from the OECD and European Commission. We've learned that earlier this year, Gillian was, oh, sorry, Gillian was conferred the title of Emeritus Professor at the University of Queensland, for which we offer our warmest congratulations. We are so pleased that you could join us this evening, Gillian, and to share your valuable expertise and historical knowledge of pay equity cases in Australia. Please welcome Gillian. <laughs> Liberty Sanger is a principal and board member at Maurice Black Maurice Blackburn Lawyers, where she leads the National Personal Injury Law Division and has been recognised by the prestigious Doyle's Guides as one of five leading lawyers in workers' compensation in Victoria. Liberty is a driving force and change agent for gender equality, not only within her firm, but also at a broader scale within society. She shares, she, sorry, excuse me, she serves as chair of Morris Blackburn's Diversity and Inclusion Steering Committee, as well as chair of the Victorian Government's Equal Workplaces Advisory Council, and is a member of the Ministerial Council on Women's Equality, which is responsible for providing expert advice to the Victorian Minister for Women. These various roles means Liberty is intimately involved in identifying and recommending best practice strategies and government action to promote the achievement of gender equality. <coughs> Morris Blackburn articulates the pursuit of equality in the workplace as developing initiatives that ensure that every employee can thrive in an accepting and supportive environment. In recognition of her dedication to driving gender equality initiatives within and beyond the legal profession and fostering a new generation of women leaders, Liberty was inducted into the 2019 Victorian Honour Roll of Women. Welcome, Liberty. I, uh, we have a very special woman from Australia, <coughs> Australia's uh, history in this space tonight sitting with us here. Iola Matthews lived through and was part of the historic changes that unfolded during Australia's evolution towards achieving equal rights and representation of women throughout the 1970s and 1980s. Iola was co-founder of the Women's Electoral Lobby. Iola served as the Council of Trade Unions, ACTU Industrial Officer, during the accord period of the Hawke and Keating governments. During this time, she served as an advocate for in national test cases to improve wages and conditions for women workers, including the parental leave case and equal pay cases for childcare workers and clerical workers. Iola helped establish the Action Plan for Women in the Victorian Public Service and was, was appointed as coordinator of the Action Program for Women Workers at the ACTU. Iola has served on the Victorian Women's Advisory Council to the Premier, the ALP Victoria Status of Women Committee, and the ACTU's Women Committee, the National Labour Consultative Council Committee on Women's Employment, and the expert group on the impact of structural adjustment excuse me, on women in Commonwealth countries. In recognition of his services to advance the status of women and women's employment, Iola has been honoured with an Order of Australian Medal. A former journalist, Iola recently released her book, Winning for Women, A Personal Story, which tells her story of this pivotal time for women's rights in Australia's history. We have copies of Iola's book available here tonight at the back. Welcome, Iola. And last but not least, <laughs> we have Professor Roger Wilkins, who's made an extremely valuable contribution to our knowledge base on labour market inequality in Australia and the capacity of our research community to undertake this type of analysis. He's the Deputy Director of the Household Income Labour and Dynamics in Australia Survey, or HILDA for short at the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research at the University of Melbourne, and Deputy Director of the Melbourne Institute itself. As Australia's preeminent longitudinal household study, HILDA provides a rich collection of data to us to analyze across a range of economic and social issues. Roger produces the annual HILDA survey statistical report and also serves on the <coughs> ABS Labor Statistics Advisory Group. It's because of data collections such as HILDA, along with WGIA data and ABS data, that we can undertake the type of data analysis to interrogate gaps in economic opportunities, outcomes, and well-being. Roger's research focused strongly on inequality, particularly in relation to earnings and labor market outcomes. 
and his, he takes particular interest in better understanding poverty, social exclusion and welfare dependence. He produces the Australian Income Component of the World Inequality Database, a policy advisor for the Australian Council of Social Service. He explored the gender pay gap in relation to minimum wage award setting as well as glass ceiling phenomenon at the top end of the distribution. We thank Roger for lending his expert economic insights to tonight's discussion. And to moderate the discussion, we're joined by Dr. Leonora Rees, who is Vice Chancellor's Postdoctoral Fellow at RMIT University. In her own research, Leonora has investigated women's labour force participation, maternity leave entitlements, and gender differentials in the labour market in relation to pay and promotion outcomes. She previously worked as an economist at the Productivity Commission and earned her PhD in economics from the University of Queensland. Leonora was one of the inaugural committee members who formed the National Women in Economics Network when, in 2017, in response to the underrepresentation of women in the economics profession in Australia. She currently serves as chair of the Victorian branch of WEN and sits on the Victorian Economic Society of Australia Council. Later this year, she'll be heading to Harvard University to take up an appointment as the 2019 to 2020 fellow with the Women and Public Policy, Public Policy Program, I've said that fast three <laughs> at the Kennedy School of Government. Can you join me in welcoming all our speakers and please thank them for being here. Thank you for that very warm introduction. When I hear about all the expertise and knowledge that we have sitting on this panel, I think if we can't solve the gender pay gap, I don't know who can. <laughs> so thank you again for everyone for making the time to come uh, this evening. Um, the, I would like to also start by acknowledging that the inspiration for this event uh, this evening. Um, it was an idea by Professor Jeff Borland, who um, apologises that he couldn't be here tonight. Those of you who know Jeff, he's a labour market economist at the University of Melbourne. And in 1999, he wrote an article, 30 years on from the 1969 <laughs> equal pay case. And um, so obviously he's, he's uh, been researching this topic for a while and I've been meaning to ask him is he planning on writing another article 50 years on from the um, equal pay case and has anything changed? Um, the aim for this evening's event is uh, threefold. Firstly to pay tribute to history. We're a product of our history. It's, it's a date that we should commemorate as a breakthrough for gender equality and um, women's rights in Australia's history. So I think it's important for us to take stock of how far we've come and to learn from the past. Secondly, we need to take stock of where we are today, looking at data and research and evidence. What is the nature of the gender pay gap today and how can we understand it? And thirdly, moving forward to the future. What do we know about what works and what doesn't? It's a multifaceted, complex issue. What can we learn from data and analysis um, as well as from history? So they're the aims for um, tonight's event. Um, please keep in mind we'll have an, an opportunity for questions towards the end. Um, even if it's not on the panel, um, our panellists, uh, some of whom will be here afterwards, are happy to, to chat with you. And also um, please uh, ensure if you're interested in a copy of Iola's book, uh, it's for sale at the back there and I believe Iola might be willing to, uh, to sign it for you as well, which is great. Okay, so let's start from history. So here's a picture um, from the past, um, which kind of captures, <laughs> captures the moment. And I'm also gonna put up some slides here, which um, are a tapestry of, of the nature of what was happening 50 years ago, the, the extent that, uh, that women had to go to. Um, and I believe that within that picture there, you might see a, a young um, Bob Hawke, who served as um, industri industrial um, advocate for the union in this equal pay case. Uh, so and while that slideshow is unfolding <laughs> in the background, Gillian, I'd love to turn to you, please, um, for a bit of insight and backdrop into what happened on this day in 1969 and how significant was it? Well, there were... <laughs> oh, yes. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, I think we 
broadly know what happened in that there was a case, there was a decision taken that certain principles would be put in place and that cases could be brought to equalise men's and women's pay under very certain circumstances, very limited circumstances. But I thought rather than talking about some of those limits to start with, I'd like to mention two particular strengths, I think, that were really significant about this case. And the first thing was the significance of showing how the Australian wage setting system could be used as a vehicle for equal pay for women. And um, some of the differences that we have here that made that this case made very clear were the way the wage setting system addressed groups and was able to disseminate results broadly. So a, an equal pay claim didn't have to come from an individual. The result wasn't limited to an enterprise, you know, to workers within a, a certain enterprise. These were problems that pay equity elsewhere uh, say in the UK, grappled with and was limited by much more significantly. So I think that that was a particular uh, strength of the Australian system that was illustrated in this case. Another thing that was important, I think, consistent with the Australian system was that it was made clear that pay and work value wasn't to be determined in purely market terms. So in some other countries, the whole equal pay campaign or project was limited by the way it could be sidestepped by arguing about value in terms of market terms. In Australia, we precluded those kinds of, of loopholes. So it illustrated those sorts of strengths of the wage setting system and really importantly, it set the groundwork for the next stage, which will be equal pay for work of equal value. Once we realised how limited the scope of equal pay for equal work would really be. So I think those are really important things to say to start with. I have a lot of comments about the limitations of it, but maybe you'd rather wait to the next round for that. Yeah, yes, I, I think what's interesting is that this date itself is commemorated as a breakthrough, which it is in many respects, but it, it, it didn't solve all, all the uh, the issues. Um, and Iola, we might turn to you because I th you, you've uh, described how the 1969 case, it was equal pay for, for equal work. There were limitations to that as to how expansive that um, could be applied to. Um, and we've just, I've also got a picture here of, of uh, to to, uh, to showcase your your attachment uh, to history. Uh, the question is, um, how should we interpret the 19, 19, 1969 decision when there were subsequent uh, industrial test cases that unfolded throughout the 70s and 80s too? So, what did the 1969 decision offer, and and how did we build on that? Um, th th that's a bit of a a tribute to your to your past up there on, uh, in the background. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, it was another good thing about the 1969 decision was that it was breaking away from the original Harvester decision that a pay should be for a male breadwinner and uh, his, I think it was three children, you know, theoretically and looking after a family. And so it was the first equal pay case and it was the first one that started to recognise that um, men and women could earn individually and that women could also be responsible for looking after a family or whatever. But it, it was limited and in fact it only affected about 18% of women because they weren't doing exactly the same work as men. And it paved the way, and I think the decision actually hinted that you probably needed to go further. So it paved the way for the 1972 equal pay for work of equal value decision, which then gave a wage increase of up to about 30% for women, so more dramatic. And in 1974, the uh, getting the minimum wage for women as well as men. So it, it, it's interesting to see how all these cases have been incremental uh, over time, one step forward and then another step forward, but the big gaps in between. Did you want me to talk about some of the later ones or leave that till later? Uh, 
Um, so I've tried to explain some of these steps in my book that, um, so we, we then had a jump between 1974 until, um, well, when I went to the ACTU, they just invented a new action program for women workers, which was in conjunction with the Hawke Keating government. Well, it wasn't a Keating government then, but he was the treasurer. And that was very dramatic because Bill Kelty and uh, Jan Marsh, who was then the national wage advocate and also an economist, largely unrecognised, a very wonderful woman, um, they drew up a very significant program based on legislation or award changes and test cases. So all the, the uh, elements of that program were really concrete steps that would be taken. And of course, we're able to work with Anne Summers at the head of the Offices of the Status of Women and Susan Ryan as the Minister for Women assisting the Prime Minister and many other wonderful people. So I was very fortunate to go there in those 10 years of the Accord when we could actually get a lot done and we were very conscious that we had to hurry up because we didn't know how long Labor would be in power and we realised that we were making history. So. Uh, one of the elements of the action program was to do a case for out workers, the women who work in their own homes earning terrible, terrible money and terrible conditions. I think they were earning one or two dollars an hour and you know really exploited. And we ran a case in the uh, what's now the Fair Work Commission for out workers and we won the right for them to get the same wages and conditions as factory workers. Um, and then we ran the, the equal pay case for nurses, which was very significant, some of you might recall, in 1987. And that was assisted, really, by the fact that the nurses then had a very, very militant leader, Irene Volger, mm -hmm. and they went on strike for, I think, 50 days. It was extraordinary. And the hospitals in Melbourne were almost ground to a halt. And um, people were encouraged to honk when they passed a hospital. So people honking all over the place. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, the managers and administrators had to get down into the wards and do the work with volunteers or just uh, turn away patients. It was a really dramatic time. And there was a Labor government in the state government, but they, um, you know, they were reluctantly giving more money and more money and the nurses were still not happy. But it coincided with a shortage of nurses, um, with nurses moving out of um, training in hospitals into universities, um, nurses getting higher qualifications, job becoming more technical. So a whole lot of factors came together to win that case and get very significant wage increases. And the age, at the end of the case, editorialised that it was due to the brains of the AC2 and the brawn of the unions, which has probably summed it up. So then we moved into, I'll try and be brief because it's a long story, but then we moved into <laughs> what was called award restructuring, um, which probably is completely forgotten now, but that, that was a way in which we had to compare all the awards with the Metal Workers Award, which is the pace setter, and that was male dominated. So um, a lot of us were able to do what we called equal pay cases. I did childcare workers and clerical workers because once you did a work value of their work and you lined it up against this male dominated union on terms of training, responsibility and so on, we're able to get big wage increases and a career structure in those industries. Um, then you jump forward and uh, probably the next milestone would have been 1993 when um, Ian Ross, who was then at the ACTU, drafted industrial relations legislation for the Keating government and it was equal pay for equal remuneration which is a huge difference to equal pay for equal work because you take into account all the above award payments, the, the um, over award payments. So that was a big jump. But unfortunately, and that's where we are now, we've still got that legislation, it has not been very successful in people winning equal pay cases. It's proven to be quite difficult for the members of the commission to interpret and unions to argue. And um, I think there's only one case in 21 that have been that has been successful in the last 30 years. And that was called the Sachs case, Social and Community Services. And Sally McManus was the main driver behind that. So now we've got some other equal pay cases in the commission. I won't talk about that just yet. Yeah. No, I think the stumbling blocks are really interesting to learn from. Um, look, I think a common theme that comes out through your stories is that a lot of this analysis is industry by industry um, and sort of case by case. Um, and so what I'd like to turn to now is some of the, the data 
Um, this is in aggregate, but we'll break it down by industry as well. So this only goes back to 1995, but um, what we see there, the dark, the dark line is uh, men's earnings and the lighter line is, is women's earnings. And what you can see is that um, that and that gap, the proportion of that um, gap is represented by that blue blue line, the gender earnings gap, which kind of hovers between around about 15% um, up to 18%. And what we, if you read into that, you'll see that the gender pay gap um, increased uh, between 2007 up to around about 2014, which does coincide with the, the mining boom. Um, so there are many layers underlying this um, pay gap, but it does suggest there could have been something that was industry specific, um, that was um, based on, on the business cycle and the volatility of different um, industries where um, wages, say in construction and mining, were accelerating more quickly than those that have more stable demand like education and health. And then we've seen a, a, a reduction in that earnings gap in recent years, um, and I think WGIA reporting requirements um, would be one of the factors driving that. Um, but it's also an easing off of the mining boom, right? So um, that previous acceleration in male-based industries has eased off. You can see that it's not necessarily the case that women's earnings have um, have you know, increased in, in their wage growth. Can I just butt in there a bit though? I think the other thing in terms of the mining industry is they have worked really, really hard at addressing gender equality issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in fact, they are really the standout industry. So whilst we've seen a decline in uh, the, the mining boom per se, we've also seen the mining industry really step up and take a lead. Yes. It yeah, um, this this is just a point in time, so you're not necessarily capturing um, what has how how far those industries have um, improved over time. Definitely, um, look, look looking also back to tie it, tie it back to the uh, historical picture here. What you can see from this data, which shows the ratio of female to male earnings, is that a lot of that improvement was made in the early years, in those early decades, and since then it has e eased off in terms of rates of um, improvement in aggregate. Um, so something's happening, which means that, that that rate of improvement from early years has just not um, converted through um, to reach full um, convergence. Uh, and this um, graph here, using ABS data, breaks it down by industry. The You can see average earnings, um, the blue line, where mining is at the highest um, earnings rate down the left hand side all the way down to um, retail trade accommodation on the right hand side and the pink dots represent females representation within that industry so there, there's a pattern there about the female dominated industries being concentrated at the lower end of the earnings spectrum overall so I think um, if what we can sort of extract from history that a lot of this is industry by industry and you've got to sort of take stock of what's been happening um, in, the, in the, those awards and within those industries as well. Um, I've also got a graph there with um, the size of the gender pay gap within each industry. Um, so finance and insurance on the left hand side has the largest largest gap um, and retail trade and public administration have the lower gap. And I think speaking to your point there, Libby, mining is around about the average um, now, but that could have been <laughs> that they've uh, improved over time as well. But we'd like to now move to the Wajia data, Libby. Um, if you could just explain for those of the audience members who aren't familiar with what Wajia does and what data it collects and what insights you've um, gained from it. Um, we'd love to hear a bit about that. So the Workplace Gender Equality Agency was set up um, to implement the Workplace Gender Equality Act 2012. Uh, it superseded what was the equal opportunity Oh golly, it was the Equal Opportunity for Women in the Workforce Act or uh, agency or something like that. But, uh, but basically, um, we've been collecting data in Australia on what's happening in workplaces for a long time. 
the issue was we weren't we didn't have standardized data and so the introduction of the workplace gender equality act mandated that all organisations in Australia in the private sector with more than 100 employees must report into us on an annual basis on six gender equality indicators. And those uh, indicators were put together based on research and consultation about what would be the best data to get in order to drive change. So they, so organisations report into us on the composition of their workforce, the composition of their boards, the pay that they pay everybody, uh, support for flexible work and caring for their employees, the consultation that they do with employees on gender equality issues, and uh, what they do in terms of sex-based harassment and discrimination, particularly around um, uh, it, what, how they train their employees. We cover roughly 4 million employees or 40% of the Australian workforce. Uh, and we actually, considering we're what they call a soft touch regulator, that is if organisations don't comply with the Act, I can't get out with a big stick. Uh, all I can do is really name and shame. But considering um, we don't have that big stick, we actually get between 98 and 99% compliance, which is uh, fantastic when you think that uh, the Act covers over 10,000 employers. So we've been collecting data now. We've just finished the sixth year. We've just stopped, uh, we've just, the period's closed for the sixth year of data collection and we'll release the data uh, once we've analysed it and uh, had a big look at it and that will happen in November. If we look at last year's data, look, um, we calculate a gender pay gap in a number of different ways. We use ABS data, and the ABS data is the data that's been around the longest, and it comes out twice a year, and it's on average weekly earnings. So we calculate, when the ABS put that data out twice a year, we get to and calculate the gender pay gap, and then we use our data, so just our data set to, to calculate a gender pay gap as well. And I think it's important to note that the gender pay gap is different to equal pay. So the gender pay gap looks at the overall position of women in an organisation or an industry or the nation or the workforce, if you like, compared to men. And there are lots of different factors that feed into that. It's not about paying women and men for the same for doing comparable jobs. So um, that, I, I think that's the important thing and that's where we see a lot of confusion between equal pay and the gender pay gap. And it's something that we are doing a lot of work on at the moment and watch this space because we should have some uh, pretty interesting information out about that um, soon. But if we look at our gender pay gap calculated from our data set, we calculate it at a base rate, so based on base salary and total remuneration. And there's a big difference between the two. But if we look at the total remuneration gender pay gap, it currently sits at 21.3%. Thanks, Libby. Yeah, we have that information on the screen behind you. And I think the comparison between the two um, calculations is really informative yeah. as well because it... it so it, the, if you look at the national gender pay gap at 14.1%, that's based on ABS figures. And that is actually dropped substantially in the last few years. This one on this side, I'm not good at left and right, there's something wrong with my brain. Um, <laughs> that That's our gender pay gap based on the 10,000 plus employers that report into us. So it says something about that sample, it says something about uh, remuneration in total rather than just um, earnings. Um, we also have a slide from Wajia Jada that um, describes what's okay. happening in construction and health. Okay, sure. So uh, when we cut the data, we can cut it in all sorts of different ways. And there's a wonderful tool called the um, Data Explorer. So if you're interested in looking at what's happening in different industries, you can go to our Data Explorer and that will break it all down for you. But if we look at industry-specific gender pay gaps, uh, yes, 
financial and insurance services ever since we've been collecting this data have had the worst gender pay gap. But to give credit where credit is due, they have their pay gap has dropped 5.8 percentage points since we've been collecting the data. So they're doing something right. Altern if we, you know, on the other hand, the construction industry gender pay gap has gone up. It's gone up by um, four percentage points since 2013-14. The construction industry's got some serious, serious problems and we need to address them. Uh, and it bothers me when I see that the New South Wales government in their budget have just announced huge amounts of money to spend on infrastructure and construction projects. It's going to make the construction industry worse, not better. It's a toxic environment for men. So if it's toxic for men, imagine what it's like if you're a, wim a woman trying to work in that environment. It has the highest suicide rate of any other industry in Australia. And these problems will get worse. And the construction industry is not great at doing anything about it. In fact, I've, I, I, uh, you'll love this. I spoke at a lunch recently with a number of CEOs of some of the big construction companies to say to them, look, you've got great power and you've got great influence if you want to use it. Look at look what the mining industry did with the minerals resource rent tax. Not only did they get rid of the tax, you could argue that they got a new Prime Minister as a result too. So I said you could do likewise. You have the power to influence. You've just got to get together and start working together. And at the end of the lunch, I was talking to a couple of the CEOs and this CEO of a big company looked down at me. He was very tall and I'm short. And he looked down at me and he said, um, yeah, well, we're very different to the mining industry. And I said, but why would that be? And he said, and you'll have to excuse my language, he said, because we fucking hate one another. <laughs> and I thought, I've just wasted two hours of my time. If that's what they think, if that's what the CEOs think, how are we ever going to change? Just on that point, though, Libby, um, it, it reminds me, as it does with the Sachs case, of the importance of government and government playing a role exactly. in this. Yeah. Um, one of the things we've seen in Victoria is the government use their social procurement policy to great effect and, <clears throat> pardon me, make... Um, demands or requirements of those that procure with government and c construction being such a large part of what um, government invests in when it comes to infrastructure and requiring a proportion of women and requiring gender yeah. equality strategies. Certainly not the whole answer because there's a lot that needs yeah. to be done in changing culture but governments can play a very big role in influencing the uh, behaviours of corporates. And I would agree. And I think that we are starting to see a little <coughs> bit of that in New South Wales. But but the issue, but you know, the issue is when you've got an industry that's being headed by people who don't want to work together, mm -hmm. there's a problem too. So yes, government have a huge role to play. And we've got to keep at government about that, mm -hmm. about insisting, you know, Five working seven day weeks is ridiculous. Local government have a role to play too. They're the ones that dictate how long, you know, the, the um, development applications. And if and many of the construction companies don't take no notice of them and working seven days a week. Mm -hmm. So local government have a role to play here as well. There are many the, in all three the tiers the of government. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it speaks to culture. It also speaks to assessing um, the quality of work, not just by the pay, but by the total environment. Um, Roger, can we turn to you and also ask for your insights on your analysis of, of the data and, and patterns of the gender pay gap um, and how we can interpret it as a measure of um, inequality? both at minimum wage level or at top end level. Yeah, so I did some work with Barbara Broadway where we were looking at um, award reliant workers, so workers being paid the relevant minimum. And uh, and despite um, what um, Ayala was talking about, the progress that had been has been made uh, in, uh, in, in, in improving minimum wages of female dominated occupations, uh, we still found to this day that uh, uh, there does, uh, well, there's good prima facie evidence that the minimum wages are, um, I guess, uh, uh, 
prejudiced against women. So that uh, so the more female the occupation, um, the lower the minimum wage for a given level of uh, education and and uh, experience of the workers in that. Uh, so uh, it, it certainly is quite suggestive of uh, some kind of uh, prejudice in the system of minimum wages. Uh, so that you know, if 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 it was if the system was neutral with respect to gender, then the the wage gap would be smaller. Um, I think though, I'd, uh, you know, I would add that. Um, uh, that uh, that's not fixing. That's not going to fix the gender pay gap. Um, that the gap is much larger at high wages, and uh, and there I think it's a lot harder for the government to uh, have a have an impact. I think legislation is going to always really struggle. Um, but I but but certainly the sorts of prodding and and uh, and shaming and naming and so forth. Um, I I can't see that. Uh, Hurting uh, at the very least, uh, um, but uh, but yes, there's certainly I think some something that could be done at the at the lower end uh, of the labour market. Yeah, so it's fair to say like the gender pay gap is a function of several factors here, both institutional, cultural, products of government intervention. If we return to the institutional framework and and the legislation, um, and the, um, the the barriers or the the stumbling blocks that arose out of the 1969 decision um, in efforts to achieve gen gender um, equality in pay, um, Gillian, would you like to um, share with us what? this notion of a male comparator is, because that seems to have sort of inf infused the system that in order to achieve uh, gender, uh, to achieve equal pay, female dominated industries needed to point out a male dominated industry that was earning more with which they could be compared as saying, you've got the same skill requirements, the same workplace responsibility. And, and we've inherited that that system in our, in our present day um, workforce? Yes, well, I mean, that was very clear in the 1969 case that were, comparisons were to be made between men and women uh, doing the same work and left the, you know, the tribunals with the difficult task of ascertaining exactly what was the same work and as we know, and you, was, you were reminding us, Iola, that in the next claim for equal pay for work of equal value, the unions were stating, well, the problem was only 18% of the workforce was, uh, the female workforce had access to that. So moving to equal pay for work of equal value did help that, but it didn't remove that idea of a male comparator. You just shifted the problem a bit further along. How do you ascertain equal value? And the tribunals were quite confident that the historical legacy of the Australian system had within it ways of ascertaining work value based on a range of different things, including comparative wage justice, perhaps. But anyway, that's a bit of a, a sideline. But certainly the idea was that um, you know, those, the, the difference in value had to be done by comparing. And the obvious thing was a comparison between male and female wages. But we've since moved to some very interesting developments in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Is it all right to, to talk about those? Because they're highly pertinent to, to this issue of a male comparator. So the states are always a bit more innovative than, than the federal <laughs> system. And in the late 1990s, New South Wales um, ran a pay equity inquiry and it went for a long time. It generated some really interesting data and reflection on, on how you might go about more effectively prosecute, prosecuting case, pay equity cases. And one of the main issues that came out of that was that we need to get rid of this idea of a male comparator. We don't want to be tied up in all the difficulties that that entails. We've been through that HPM case 
in the mid-1990s where the tribunal decided the applicants needed to prove discrimination, which was a, a particular reading of ILO 100 that many of us thought incorrect. But, um, and, and that case was really built around explicit individual comparisons. And the, the New South Wales case, New, uh, Pay Equity Inquiry, took us a long way towards letting go of some of those constraints, and particularly letting go of the idea that you had to prosecute a case through using a male comparator. The Queensland inquiry, and of course, as a Queenslander, I have to tell you about this, <laughs> but you know, the Queensland inquiry took on the lessons from the New South Wales one and took them a bit further. So what we have in Queensland is a pay equity principle which is now effectively incorporated in the revised Queensland Industrial Relations Act. And that principle sets out uh, particular criteria for which you might determine the undervaluation of women's work. So the key issue here is whether female dominated work is undervalued. And so that is one aspect of the overall gender pay gap. It's not everything, but it's, it's one important part and kind of recalcitrant part of it that uh, the tribunals have come at from various angles but found very difficult to deal with. So in setting up that pay equity principle, it was established that you did not need a comparator, as had been the case in New, Zealand, in, uh, New South Wales, I beg your pardon and that you could establish undervaluation through other means, such as looking at award histories, for example. So in the childcare case that happened in the early 2000s, for example, that award history showed discussion in the, in the documents of the description of that work as female work. You know, this is work done by women and also the dental assistance case, which was the first case that was run under the Queensland principle, where dental assistants historically were described as women who helped the dentist, and you know, it was described explicitly like that. So evidence was able to be drawn out that showed how the work had been undervalued because it was deemed to be female work. And that was one of the bodies of evidence that was able to be used. Also, whether you know, the award had been adjusted fairly in terms of work value historically. And also, there were structural issues that could be taken into account, whether it was um, highly casualised, poorly unionised, not necessarily equivalent to undervaluation, but points that you might look at uh, in order to establish that. And so it freed up the tribunals and um, a number of cases in New South Wales and Queensland took advantage of that. So major increases for the dental assistance for childcare workers and then for the social and community services workers in Queensland, which then got replicated, uh, almost <laughs> replicated uh, federally. And in that process, it's not the case that they entirely freed themselves from a male comparator. So it's very complicated still, even having come this far, it's very difficult. What I think the Queensland cases showed was that you could arrive at a decision of undervaluation without using a comparator. And that puts you in a good position. So for the commissioners in the Industrial Relations Commission, they could establish undervaluation. And then they might draw in some male comparisons to try and work out the quantum of the change that was required. Although I have to say in the childcare case in Queensland, they didn't in the end use a male comparator for that. They just looked at what they deemed to be the work value issues and arrived at a figure. <laughs> which is both frustrating in terms of how did they do that and how can we do that again, but also uh, liberating. 
Great. No, so that's, no, no, that's, that's great really, it's really interesting and important to differentiate between what it's happening at federal level and within these state levels as well. As an economist, not as a lawyer, but as an economist sitting here thinking about how do you value work, I think maybe the other economists in the room are thinking, how, how would we do that? Like if all the childcare workers went on strike for the day, you'd know their value. Well, the economists went on strike for the day. I don't know if anyone would notice, but I don't know. So I think, I think it's really interesting to look through just how it played out, how was it operationalised. Iola, would, would you like to say something on that? Oh, I just wanted to point out that the poor childcare workers did go on strike actually about, I think about three times over the past few years mm. because they spent five years trying to run mm. an equal pay case and they still haven't got there. Um, the equal remuneration order that they were going for was, for complicated reasons, didn't succeed. But the bench did say, I think it was last year, that they could run a work value case. Um, the union spent five million dollars and um, was probably hoping for a Labor government which had some policies about equal pay, but uh, so I, they haven't made any decisions or announcements about what they'll do. But I think they're, but they did go have some stop works, and I think you know, bravely, people went off the job, but not enough to have a sort of uh, big impact on the government or the commission. So that brings us to the case that is currently in the commission right now, and there's been some reports in the media. That's the independent education union case for preschool teachers and they're running both an equal remuneration order and also a work value case mm -hmm. and I think that has some chance of some success and so it will be watched carefully by other unions and other mm -hmm. occupations to see how it goes. It's, it's a bit easier in the sense that the award does have preschool teachers and primary teachers on the same, mm. in exactly the same award. So the difference is the enterprise bargains that have been done for school teachers that haven't been done for uh, preschool teachers. And so it's, it's a complicated case. We probably won't know a decision until end of the year or next year, but everybody will be watching it. Mm. It's worth also noting the ALP had it been voted into power, Tanya Plibersex, um, has, has a statement out saying that they would have done away with the need for a male comparator in, in the federal tribunal system. Uh, Roger, did you want to...? Well, yeah, you introduced uh, uh, economics, so I'm, I'm uh, going to uh, 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 take advantage of that to, I guess, put my economist lens on this issue, which for me, uh, you know, we, we talk about you know, these industries or occupations in which, which are more uh, f female, they have higher portions of female workers. And the question that immediately pops into my mind is, well, why are women working in these jobs? You know, why aren't they deserting them? You know, th there's choices being made here. And as a, an economist, we're, we're taught to treat preferences sacrosanct. And, and so people are making the decisions that they uh, think are in their uh, in their best interests, and so I, and, and so you know, we, we, the question is, why aren't these women going to other industries, other occupations, where they can make more money, and and so I think that changes the perspective a bit on what you might think the problem is, and and in particular, I think it starts to make you think less about the labour market, and more about what is going on in the home and in the broader community and, and, and uh, you alluded to it before about um, you know, social attitudes and, and, and culture and, and, and norms. So you know, the, the HILDA data, for example, would show that uh, um, in, in couple families, the women always do more of the housework, more of the childcare, and it doesn't matter how much each partner's working in the paid labour market. There's a, there's a uh, you know, it's, it's very, uh, um, indicative of, of, a, of a, I think, a, a deeper problem that's not really, the, the labour market's reflecting a deeper-seated inequality or, or uh, um, um, perhaps you might characterise it as a malaise, um, rather than causing it. And uh, how you go about moving that, shifting that dial, that's, uh, that's actually, that's, that's above my pay grade, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, um, but I think that's what we are. If you know, if we're, that's what we are dealing with here. Uh. 
Uh, just on the um, the success or otherwise of these equal remuneration orders, um, as Iola mentioned, we've had 21 uh, cases, I think, that have gone forward and only one succeed. And it's often noted that this, the success of that case was probably in part because we had the Commonwealth <laughs> Government supporting the order and coming up with the funding, which I think really goes to show the, the reality of succeeding in these cases. Um, I don't know that we learned a lot about what the evidence needs to be to uh, to succeed in these cases around value in in um, in one of these and in fact in the the more recent case the United Voice case um, we saw uh, that fail um, and a reversion back to the same test around the need for the the comparator so what I take from that is if we're to see success when it comes to the achievement of equal pay, success in increasing women's wages, success in moving these feminised industries um, up to a level that is comparable. We cannot rely on the legislation that we have today. And if we, if we reflect on the last 50 years, we saw some very early successes from um, what I would argue was a low base, but it was where we were at the time. But we haven't moved very much over the last 20, 30 years, and we really need to have a, another think about what we do about the feminised industries because it, the, the system as it is, the legislation is not fit for purpose. Um, it's very, very hard to establish the relevant comparator. In fact, as I said, I think it's almost impossible unless you have the government coming in offering the funding and supporting the application and, and the Commission being aware of that because it is one of the factors that the Commission has to take into account, the ability of, of the employer to pay uh, at the end of the day. So um, I think uh, Mary, to paraphrase Mary Gordon, who said way, way back um, sometime after the, the 1969 case, you know, we won the, the right to equal pay in 1969, we won it again in 1972, we won it again in, in 1974 and we've been winning the right ever since but we have not achieved it. Um, and and that is a that group of workers uh, that rely on awards is a group that we need to find a whole new solution for. Um, there is another group of workers that we are getting better, I think, at assisting uh, because we have employers who are engaged around gender equality strategies and transparency in workplaces and targets, and we have uh, a, a group of women that are much more mobilised and engaged in the debate and will no longer accept um, these differences in, in the gender pay gap. Um, but there is still a long way to go there too. But it, I think we need to be really clear about the limitations of the law when it comes to achieving gender equality. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to turn the, the discussion, up, uh, Gillian, we'll call, um, to open, Can give I you the opportunity. Can I just make a quick, quick comment on that? And I think that's right, there are all sorts of problems with, uh, you know, the Fair Work Act, which could be helped, could, you know, the Fair Work Act could be amended slightly. It needs to have gender equity as one of its objects, for example. You know, it's a bit odd that it doesn't. So that's a starting point. And I should say about the childcare case where the decision was that the applicants had to go away and find a male comparator was a particular interpretation of the Act. It, it didn't need to be interpreted that way, and it wasn't being, but it was just interpreted that way in that case. So it doesn't really need to be changed if someone's prepared to interpret it differently, but it could be changed to specify that you do not need, specify that you do not need a male comparator. And one way to do that, and that a lot of us have always encouraged the federal system to do is to adopt a pay equity principle. So like the Queensland one that does specify those things and a number of other things. So I think the legislative system can be made to work. It has worked occasionally. It has worked at state level yes. in a number of ways. So it's not something we want to dismiss altogether but we do need to recognise the difficulties around that. How do we make those judgments? And we do need to recognise that that whole prosecution of undervaluation cases is just one aspect 
of overall gender inequality. So the system might not be completely broken. We should, uh, shouldn't give up hope completely, but at the same time, we probably also need to be turning to other um, firm-specific or business-specific or government-specific uh, solutions or as well. Gen General culture. Or gender <laughs> order-specific, you know, changing the nature of yeah. the gender order. Maybe that's something. We'll and to. I think also reflecting on Roger's point too about you know what are, what are the motivations to enter particular industries or choose a career or a pathway? How does that differ by gender? And to what degree are we actually not taking into account this um, public value, the society wide value of? say childcare workers or aged care workers, it's more than just their market pay. And I think the economists in the room would appreciate that we're talking about public externalities that really just aren't factored into that dollar value. Um, I don't know how far the law has sort of ventured into that sort of economic <laughs> or economist uh, terrain. Um, there are economic studies that attempt to pinpoint what would be the total societal value of a childcare worker or a teacher or a, a, um, a nurse, for instance. I just wanted to pick up on, on Roger's point also that I think he's right that there's another part of the whole equation is encouraging girls uh, at school and university to do courses that lead to the higher paid jobs. And I mean, obviously we're trying to address centuries of conditioning because women are more in the caring professions. They like to work with small children or looking after people or teaching or age care or whatever, um, men by and large are conditioned not to go into those sort of areas. So we do, you know, the Senate Committee on Gender Segmentation went into recommendations about that and there are programs to try and get women into the STEM areas, but there's a lot more to be done and maybe there's a lot more to be done to get men to, to not be so prejudiced, you know, against the, the so-called caring professions. Um, and the other thing is, you know, he's touched on the enormous thing about the unequal sharing of jobs in the home, caring for children in the family and domestic. And there's a huge amount of work to be done there that, um, you know, we've hardly scratched the surface on that. I think it's fascinating for those of you who are parents or are surrounded by young children, when you look at children's TV shows and um, the, the role models and the templates that are put forward in cartoon characters or toys as to what your roles are in society. It starts from such an early age and that conditioning process can be so strong. If we turn... Oh, Liberty, well, I yes. think I was actually going to turn to Libby, but the gender pay gap starts with pocket money, doesn't it? Sadly, it does. <laughs> and, you know, I still don't understand why we don't include uh, unpaid work in GDP. I mean, Marilyn Waring's been on about it for years. And, and in fact, you know, when GDP was designed, the, the, the two economists that designed it, it was pointed out to them by a woman that it was flawed, that it wouldn't, that it was, it, it wouldn't work particularly in countries in Africa where so much of the work was unpaid. And we just, we just completely ignore it. And I, I just don't think that we can until we start recognising how important unpaid work is in, our, in every community. Uh, this, I fear that, that the work that women traditionally do will continue to be undervalued when it's paid as well. So Hilda data does, the Hilda survey does contain data on uh, hours of um, unpaid work and, and um, childcare, for instance. And also I can confirm that the ABS is uh, reinvigorating the time use survey and it will hopefully include information that can really put a metric on those yes, hours. But it's, but it's still not being included in GDP. Yes, yes, and that, so that's the nonsense <laughs> of it, you know? I think, I think the flaws of GDP are, 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 are sort of just compounding, <laughs> Roger. Leonora, just one other statistic. I think if you look at ABS data for take-home pay, it's about 30, 32% gap, and that's because women are more likely to work part-time. Mm. And that's, that's where it really makes a difference in the family. And so what we need is much more flexibility for men to work part-time. And at the moment, that's culturally difficult in workplaces or for a whole range of reasons. Yes, that's right. So the, the policy can be there, culture and practice needs to, to catch up. I think there's even a study that shows that um, when you look at 
tax returns, men are more likely to claim more on their tax return as well. So there's all these little pockets of, of just um, the wedge and the gap opening up. Sorry, I just thought of something else. Overtime. You know, <laughs> overtime is hugely um, used by men and much, much less by women. And when I was at the ACTU, we tried to get policy to um, reduce the amount of overtime and there was almost a revolution. We just couldn't get it through. Oh, it's why it's so important. Again, I feel like I'm speaking on your patch here, but it's so important that when uh, when you measure the gender pay gap, you take into account total remuneration because right. there is so much hidden in the bonuses, um, shift know, still out. all of that. So if we, if we turn now to, to how, if we were accumulating this data, we've got a solid face of how, um, you know, how the extent of um, the gap and, and the discriminatory forces at play. How do we con how do we convince governments and businesses to change? Um, Liberty, you provide advisory um, recommendations in, in various roles. What have you found seems seems to work? What seem what do governments actually take note of? Well, I feel like I've been very blessed in that I I was appointed to chair this council as a product of the government having committed to the gender equality strategy and um, and this government having a view that uh, there are a number of outputs of gender inequality, um, sort of at, at, its, at its lowest casual sexism and you see sexual harassment, um, unequal pay and right through to uh, violence and um, in the most horrific cases, death and all of those things being outputs of gender inequality for which they want a strategy to deal with all. And in fact, picking up on your earlier point, Roger, about how do we help move and shift uh, attitudes in the home. So the council I chair is looking specifically at the workplace and through an even more forensic lens around equal pay. Uh, so I have been, um, and our council has been uh, blessed in that we have a receptive government uh, who wants to hear about practical strategies that is going to shift the dial. Uh, one of the things that we took to the government before the last election was the incorporation of gender pay principles uh, into um, the bargaining round that's coming up for, for public servants and they committed to that and we'll now see how that evolves. Um, they came from New Zealand, interestingly enough, where we've seen some big successes with these gender pay principles. Uh, for uh, uh, women in feminised industries, uh, very big pay increases. But once again, um, what I observe is that it comes with the commitment of government. It was the tripartite arrangements, negotiated outcomes, uh, but a commitment to achieving gender equality, recognising that it was no longer acceptable, it, if it ever was, to have um, big pockets of the workforce underpaid. Uh, I think our real challenge uh, when it comes to your question about governments is to persuade the naysayers that this is not a fringe issue or this is um, um, not an issue that is, you know, you know, the top one, two or three that that people might vote on or at the end of the day regard as sort of the, um, the you know, hitting the hip pocket nerve. And increasingly we see with data that women are understanding that they are uh, not being paid fairly um, one of the things, though, that we probably don't see enough of is a, an understanding that within these uh, industries that rely on awards, that they themselves are uh, victims of unequal pay. So we know that in every industry there is a pay gap, um, but award-based workers tend to see this more as a, a middle-class issue, um, something that doesn't affect them as much because they can rely on an award to determine their, their pay scale. So there is more work for all of us to do to really highlight uh, what, it, what the impact of unequal pay is and that in turn will help uh, move governments of whichever persuasion uh, because they're always acutely interested in one thing which is their election or re-election. Um, so if these issues become issues that move voters um, then we will see movement. I do think the pendulum has shifted. I think there is less tolerance um, across the board as a, a general statement about unequal pay, but it is being able to um, amplify why in a particular instance this is unequal and warrants um, being fixed. That is 
part of the challenge. It does speak to the importance of collecting that information and that evidence space and communicating it clearly. Um, Libby, in your engagement with businesses, what has convinced them that it's important enough to take seriously, especially those who might initially be naysayers? Um, well, I think uh, analysing organisations' own data is absolutely vital because you don't know what you don't know. And so whilst the data that we produce for them and more broadly is important, uh, it's not not everybody looks at it. So that's why we encourage organisations to analyse their own data and to accept and understand that there is – that this isn't just the right thing to do, this is the smart thing to do because there is very much a business case out there. I guess the thing that's keeping me awake at night is that as we see – start to see a bit of an economic downturn, I am – witnessing and I'm hearing stories and, and, and seeing organisations um, as they start to downsize, cut costs, cut employee numbers, they're targeting, targeting first diversity and inclusion areas of their business. And it is really disturbing me because it tells me that they're just giving us lip service as to the importance of gender equality, diversity and inclusion in general. So I thought that, you know, we could stop talking about the business case, but clearly not. We've got to revisit those key messages and start pushing them out again. The other thing that I think is, going, is concerning me if we see this economic downturn is that, of course, the low-hanging fruit for all employers are the part-timers. And with women working part-time at three times the rate of men, women are going to be the ones that suffer here. So, which means it's even more important to have the gender equality and your diversity and inclusion specialists kept in their roles and to be seen as an integral part of the business. And if you analyse your own data, for instance, as BHP did, they found out that their sites that were more gender, had better gender balance, not only were they reaching their production targets sooner, but they were actually safer. And so when the CEO and the board saw that, they had an obligation to act. And instead of just handballing the problem to usually some poor woman in HR and saying, here, honey, this is your job, off you go and do it, they actually treated it as a business issue. They gave it, they gave it a cost centre, they allocated budget to it, and they have been working, for instance, in some of their workshops. So in a, one of their workshops in Western Australia, they have now um, redesigned all the tools in that workshop so that they are suspended from the ceiling and no longer need brute force to operate. So that means that women, men, anybody can operate that machinery, those tools. And what they've seen as a result of that is not only... Not only uh, better numbers of women coming in, but of course lower injury rates too. So BHP are actually, you know, putting their money where their mouth is here and treating it just as they treat occupational health and safety, just as they treat sales, just as they treat any sort of business development area. It is a critical part of their business. Yes, I, I, you speak to some really important points that there's a risk that it could be seen as a luxury, like an extra flourish, um, especially to have um, appeal to consumers or clients, but it's not a necessity for the everyday operation of business. And as economist, I'm tempted to think that really we need to reconceptualise diversity and inclusion as a driver of productivity yes. and, and growth and performance and really expand our KPIs and our performance indicators um, to be more holistic. Uh, do you see businesses heading in that in that direction, or, or, or governments heading in that direction? Um, well, we, what what we know from our data is we, there is an accountability gap. So organisations will put a gender equality policy or strategy in place. Uh, they may or may not put targets or an action plan in place. 
But even if they do, they're often not making people accountable for the outcomes. And if you're not making people accountable for the outcomes, you're just not going to get there. So we have got an accountability gap here. That's absolutely one thing that we've identified through the data. And whatever you do, you must make people accountable for achieving those positive outcomes. Yeah, so some, some of the strategies that seem to be emerging or at least being contemplated as, as a way forward is to introduce greater transparency in the pay pay gap. Um, and uh, the UK, my understanding is the UK is going ahead with this. There's a really interesting case study from Denmark in 2006. Denmark mandated public disclosure of the pay gap. Um, and what they found is that the pay gap indeed narrowed and it wasn't because female earnings were catching up to men, it was because male earnings um, slowed down or plateaued. Um, and so maybe that policy advice isn't going to be very appealing if you if you uh, sort of put join the dots and think, well, is the way to closing the gender pay gap to actually put the brakes on the stronger wage growth of, of male earnings? So I see the gender pay gap as a symptom of a broader problem. And the broader problem is a cultural problem that we have to address. I think what they're doing in the UK is fantastic uh, in, in that they are, they are organisations have to publish their gender pay gap based on um, a methodology that the uh, Government Equities Office uh, tell them to use. I think the approach that we're taking here though uh, and that we took in 2012 uh, is, is better in that we are capturing all the data. Um, we are world leading. There is no other country in the world collecting the depth and breadth of data around what is happening in workplaces in terms of gender equality. No other country is doing it. Australia is leading the way. Um, we are working with other countries who are really interested in using our model. Uh, Chile, in fact, the president of Chile on International Women's Day announced that they would be introducing legislation based on ours to get mandatory reporting in the private sector. Um, so we take that broader approach and say that we've got to counter, uh, we've got to address all of these problems in order to address the gender pay gap, and the gender pay gap is one of those. I think I'm really keen to see what happens in the UK over the next couple of years uh, to see if it does make a difference. Uh, and I think that there's certainly, you know, and I'm preempting one of your questions here, but I certainly think that there is some research, further research we could do in this area to see if things like, uh, to, to see whether publishing pay gaps whether we um, whether we look at uh, this the secrecy around pay claw pay pay and pay clauses and things like that, we need some further research around that to see whether there is a distinct link between that and the the closing of the gender pay gap because there's not a lot of research in that area at the moment. No, I'm very glad for you to segue to that, <laughs> Roger. Yeah, you, you've just reminded me that I think it's the uh, University of California, uh, their, all their academic staff salaries are uh, public information. Um, what I haven't seen is whether anyone studied whether that's had an effect on narrowing the gender pay gap. We can't, we can't find any research. We, we, because when we put in our... Um, we, we, there was a Senate inquiry into this and uh, we searched high and wide uh, to find a link you know, through research and we couldn't see any. So that's, there's a real research gap there. But what, at the risk of, um, of uh, relying on anecdotes, don't we hear from business that um, uh, men are more likely to go in and ask for a higher starting salary, for example, whereas women are more likely to accept the salary that is advertised? Am I relying only on anecdote or is that evidence-based when, <laughs> when I assert that? Uh, Wow. I, I do think there are economic studies that show that um, we, uh, men are more likely to initiate negotiations, but also that when women are forced to negotiate, sometimes it's not necessarily the better outcome as well. So, so there's mixed. And, uh, and I think too, we have, as women, we have to know our value. You've got to know your market value when you're going into a job. But the other thing is, how many times have we all sat in an interview and 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 a recruiter or the person interviewing says, well, you know, what's what are you earning now? What's your salary expectation? 
And I think it's incumbent on all of us to turn that around and say, no, no, what are you offering? And I'll tell you whether that meets my expectation. Because we know, yet yeah, we do know, that but, but think about it too. For an organisation, if you've got a woman asking for 180 and a man asking for, you know, in these senior jobs for 250, and that's not unusual, uh, you know, they'll often go with the woman because they'll save some budget. You know, so so we've got to we've got to turn it round and say no. What what are you offering? And I'll tell you whether that fits with my expectation. Yeah, I think there's a meme out there that says women like men only cheaper. But, it's, <laughs> but you need to <laughs> you need to compare um, performance and, and productivity. Um, just in closing, we'll, we'll we'll turn to the audience for some questions. But I'd just like to offer all of the panel an opportunity um, to, to say any any final final comments on on this discussion. Uh, to this point, is is there a particular a gap in the in the research and the knowledge base that we we are missing, especially if we think about learning from history? Well, I think it's been said already, but it's just this is a complicated problem, and there's lots of reasons for it, and there's lots of strategies that we need to address to try and grapple with it. And I used to get frustrated with women in the women's movement who would just say, we need to fix the legislation, as though we could, you know, legislate to fix the whole thing overnight. So um, in my book, I've written suggestions for reform and tried to, to work out some of the multiple things that need to be done. I mean, to, I guess, put this discussion in, a, in an international context, I think it's probably worth pointing out that Australia is pretty much smack bang on the OECD average in, in terms of our, our gender pay gap. And, uh, um, you know, there are some countries with a slightly smaller gap and, and other countries with bigger gaps. And I mean, there has been a trend downwards in the OECD over the last several decades. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, despite, it, it does suggest, given the diversity of economies that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're considering there, that, um, that this is not a not going to be an easy problem to solve. I, I, and, I, and I suppose I would have to confess I'm not all that optimistic. Um, if, if we thought that the optimal gap was... I, I don't even actually know what the optimal gap is. Uh, I really struggle with it. Uh, Zero? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's even she negative. Can't ask, a question, say, ask a question like that with us around. Yeah. I know. I, 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 I was... I was Determined not to say anything outlandish or stupid, but I've not failed. Uh, oh, look, maybe I can help you out here, Roger. If we return to the 1969 legislation, which I've got on the screen there, which acknowledges the complexities, I think, as all of our panellists have pointed towards, it actually suggests that had the decision been freed of this notion of having a, a male worker who needed to be offered this premium to cover his um, wife and three children, and if you had a, a clean slate and you had to decide on, on the wage, it would actually be somewhere between the male rate and the female rate, so somewhere in the middle. So coming back to this idea of somehow converging and maybe turning the attention to males wages um, rather than all the onus on those female occupations to really catch up. Can I just make one comment? I, I'm, I'm always sceptical of the OECD figures because every country uses a different data set to measure the, the gender pay gap. They use different methodologies. Uh, and so, you know, I think we need to rely on the data that we, co we collect. I think we can say quite comfortably that there is not a country in the world that does not have a gender pay gap. I think we accept that. I think we accept the data that we have. I think that we acknowledge that we are going, I'm, I'm a glass half full person, you can tell, we acknowledge that we're going in the right direction and we acknowledge that we cannot stop, that we have got to keep at this. We have got to keep challenging each other. We have got to keep challenging ourselves. Gender stereotypes have caused much of what we see now. There is a lot that we need to keep doing. But let's also acknowledge the great work that's been done by so many who came before us and just keep at it. So. Uh, Let's concentrate on what we can do here and share with the rest of the world some of the great work that we're doing and also learn from them. 
Um, I just want to say that um, having come out of a place where there's collective action, I think women sometimes forget that you can do more in a group than you can as an individual. And, you know, before we get too excited about the 14%, the higher up you go in the workplace, the bigger the gap is. And I read somewhere that with radiologists, the women are getting hundreds of thousands of dollars less than their male counterparts. But individually, they probably can't do much. But if they all got together and, I don't know, talk to the College of Radiologists or that went on strike or something, I'm sure they'd get a lot further. Yeah, so the message is not to be complacent and, and, and to, to unite in your joint voice, voices. I know I would add to that to be impatient. Um, when we do hear international data with all of those caveats, Libby, I think it's something like it would take 200 years to close the, the gender pay gap, um, which is a little too long for me. Um, but I, I do wonder whether when we talk about this, we see the end point ourselves and, and whether we need to reframe our language and start talking about the time within which we will achieve zero gender pay gap. Um, so we need to be impatient, we need to share the information, we need to act collectively no matter where we are uh, and we need to um, ensure there is a place for everybody in this discussion. Um, uh, I don't think it's a mistake that the women's movement has ever made but for whatever reason um, many men have not felt like this is a part of their conversation and where I see the greatest success you see men who are equally championing this cause whether it's because of uh, financial reasons, the moral reasons, um, uh, simply the right thing to do reasons. But we, it's, it's an issue for all of us. It's not an issue for any one of us. Collectively, yes. Yes, uh, we'll throw to the audience for, do we have a question, any questions from the audience? Yes, down here. Uh, my question is about within industry, uh, within industry pay gap. How much can that be explained in terms of difference in hours worked, uh, human capital that people bring to it and so on? And then my observation is, well, if I'm in the finance industry and I can pay women 20% less than men, why don't I have a female only workforce and beat the bloody hell out of that mob next door that have got a male only workforce? And so it seems to me there's got to be some explanation on the demand side mm. as well as Roger's story on the supply side. That would mean that you would assume that capital acts rationally, though. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone in the room think that? <laughs> uh, isn't, uh, unconscious bias, I think, would be one of the, the things that you would look to there. So the um, people recruit people who look like themselves and sound like themselves and are often unwilling to look beyond that is the first point. And the second point would be we see the gender pay gap become very pronounced at the time that uh, women become mothers and then um, for what reasons that they might describe as choice but it also might be a conditioning and it's also what we don't uh, do and don't allow for male workers. We see women taking on part-time work and the gender pay cap becoming more pronounced. They're less likely to be promoted, all the unconscious bias that um, uh, leads to higher wages in the workforce um, are exhibited at that point. So they're not promoted, they're not paid higher, they're, they're super is less, and then we see uh, a, a pronounced gender pay gap on retirement. I agree, have often made the point you've just made that um, if capital was rational, then for reasons not only connected with um, the pay, but perhaps productivity and outputs, <laughs> you would have a principally female workforce. Yeah. Of, co of course, the occupational composition uh, within these industries is not the same for men and women and that'll be a big part of the of the story. Um, I think also with something like finance you may it, it may there may be a role for discrimination but it's actually driven by clients rather than the employers themselves so uh, it's it's you know, it's possible that, um, that that biases of people who use financial services are that if I, I take more seriously mm -hmm. financial advice from men you know, so Libby has to catch a plane, so we're going to have to farewell. But I think also one way to sum up the answer is there's so much about the gender pay gap that is irrational, that just can't be explained, right? So we're still digging for answers. Um, apologies to... Um, that's quite unconventional, but I think we'll give, we'll give, a, we'll give a round of applause to Libby in, in, in any respect. Yes, thank you. 
thank you so much, Libby. Uh, does anyone else need to go to the airport and catch up? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. No, we've got a great collection of, of, of um, people in the room, so we will continue the discussion for a few more minutes. Um, thank you very much, Libby, for all your direction, and um, we're determined to make Australia best practice in its data collection practices, so thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? Is that a hand? Yes. Yes. Danny? Yes. Thanks for an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know whether you had any um, thanks perspectives on the extent or whether this is an issue for particular subgroups of female populations, such as women of culturally diverse backgrounds or um, of different socioeconomic characteristics. Yeah, so which women are perhaps most vulnerable to the gender pay gap or most exposed to it? I don't have any data I can call on, but um, to pick up on, on the point that Iola made um, earlier, uh, you do see the industries where um, women are not unionised and um, are more vulnerable as being ones where they are more likely to have um, casual employment, less secure employment, uh, and so consequently you, you would expect that they're not likely to be remunerated uh, fairly and appropriately. Um, the converse of that is when you see studies around uh, the benefits of having a diverse workforce, when you segment it just by gender, it's um, this is a McKinsey study that I'm relying on, I think it said you, you were more likely to, to you had a 15% um, likelihood of being above the, the median in your financial performance when you had a culturally diverse workforce in addition to uh, a gender diverse workforce, then it was more likely to be 35%. So um, I'm probably talking about two different segments of the economy there. We're seeing vulnerable workers um, more likely to be exploited and we're, we're, we're having to think differently about the workforce and how we care for that group of workers that might not be getting anywhere near a unionised workforce. And then with other parts of the uh, workforce, we know that rational employers will see that type of data and... Uh, want to have a more culturally diverse workforce. Um, mind you, the, the study or the report where I saw that study quoted was one where the former um, Race Discrimination Commissioner, Tim Soutpomasam, was agitating for similar strategies to be introduced in workplaces in Australia as uh, for race as it had been for gender in order to achieve greater um, cultural diversity inside workforces. Ayola, did you want to comment on, on that question? No, I don't have any data on that, but I guess anecdotally you would expect that in very low paid wages you might it might attract people who don't have many skills and don't have very good English and you know are just forced to get uh, the jobs that they can find. Do you have anything on that, Roger? Um, I mean, obviously we know that independently um, being from uh, 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 non-English speaking background countries as the or it, uh, there's a the term now is CALD but I've forgotten what it stands for. <laughs> Cultural, <laughs> culturally and ling linguistically diverse. But yeah the, so the, we, I, you know, obviously we know there's, there's a penalty for for that and we know that, and there's also you know we've been talking about the the, the female penalty but I, the interaction between the two I'm not sure about. Um, uh, I haven't looked at that. So. I do think we have the data to unpack all of these, even going back to John's question earlier as well. You can isolate the effect of industry or human capital or demographic characteristics using econometric tools. Uh, Gillian, did you, would you like to comment on that? Perhaps the role of the, the unionised or award-based um, well, we system? Were, we were talking before about um, award-reliant workers and the biggest group in that is um, community and personal service workers who account for, I think, around a quarter of um, award-reliant workers. Uh, so that is a big group. And while I don't have the data to state this authoritatively, I understand that those are jobs where there is also a high proportion of, um, yeah, people, um, immigrants, you know. So I think there's there's a connection there, and we'd probably find if we if we looked at it closely that there are 
um, compounding penalties uh, that accrue and that some of those lower paid or award reliant um, occupations and industries are also disproportionately comprised of uh, people from a range of different backgrounds. It's, it's I mean, the, the focus on intersectionality in feminist theories is very um, strong on this sort of issue, but I'm sorry, I just don't have the data to, to say what the impact of a combination of female, <laughs> certain background, perhaps disability, you know, other factors would deliver. It probably speaks to a knowledge and information problem as well. So these, these types of workers may be um, assuming that they're getting what they're entitled to, but they don't have the means to, um, to Well, we certainly that. see that in cases of recalcitrant employer practice, you know, uh, employers that shift risk to employees in, um, uh, in quite blatant ways, underpay workers, don't uh, contribute superannuation for them. Well, watch Four Corners sometimes, you'll see a number of, <laughs> of those kind of exposés. And often the people at the receiving end are people here on visas or, yeah. People. Um, on that score, I'm reminded of the, the 7-Eleven case that, that yeah. we um, prosecuted with um, the shop assistants you know, we, Morris Blackburn, wearing my other hat at the moment, um, but um, a clear pattern of um, taking advantage of students here on visas um, and being shockingly underpaid. It's it, it does always remind me these discussions how complicated things are because it, you know that's at the the lower end of the market and um, yet there is data on. Uh, uh, the likelihood of someone receiving a job interview when they present with their own name um, as opposed to a name that comes from the cultural majority. Um, uh, a book that might appeal to all of you if you haven't um, looked at it as economist is Iris Bonnet's book on, I think it's called What Works, but she's an economist from um, Harvard, I believe, and she takes you through a journey of just simply what works when it comes to redesigning workplaces um, to eliminate the bias. So you destructure, so you, you will you um, debias workplaces rather than trying to debias people because we have learned over many years that it's quite hard to debias people. Totally recommend that, recommend that book. Iris Bonnet was our keynote speaker at our gender economics workshop earlier this year, and we had that book, courtesy of Readings, on sale as well. Um, but it, it it speaks to the institutional architecture and how we are a product of our societal upbringing, and we carry these unconscious biases and affinity bias, for instance, and it seeps into our decision making um, without us realizing. So this whole this whole issue is a is a product of not just the wider institution but also those personal interactions and when you're in an interview panel and to what degree are those interview interviewers totally cleansed of, of these biases mm -hmm. really fascinating material to go into um, any last questions from the audience oh, we've got we've got two we've got Brad and, and Lisa yeah I'll, I'll be quick small businesses are they better or, better or worse so that question was small businesses, are they better or worse? Uh, well, at EWAC, we, I keep shifting my hats around, the Equal Workplaces Advisory Council will have a specific focus on small business over this next period. And uh, what I find from small business is that there is an enthusiasm to do the right thing, but um, not a lot of time. They don't have an HR department. They don't have um, time to go to courses to learn how to do this. And so the challenge for the Victorian government in getting behind our focus on this is what resources can we provide that will make it quick and easy for small businesses to engage and how can we re reward and recognise? Um, again, I'm speaking on Libby's behalf here, but I know that the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, even though small businesses are not within their remit, are, they're going to have a particular focus on trying to assist small business. So small business has been a hard one to tackle. They have not thought they've as a group, if I'm generalising, they've not thought they've had a great deal of flexibility around parental leave, promotion, 
um, uh, career pathways, but there are lots of things that they can do in order to bring about gender equal workplaces. Of course, some are all female dominated. That's a different um, story altogether. So one thing I would say is that um, uh, employees of small businesses are much more likely to be award reliant uh, than employees of uh, larger employers. And so, uh, well, we've talked about how they're, that, uh, that the gender gap's still not zero amongst award reliant workers, but it is narrower than, uh, than amongst the general um, a workforce. So uh, you might expect the gap to be a little bit narrower actually amongst small business, but uh, not because of HR policies or anything like that. <laughs> uh, Lisa. Um, yeah, I'd like to just come back to something that um, Liberty touched on a little bit, and that's the issue of um, male champions. Um, so we've talked about this as, a, as an issue for women, but I think you know the gender pay gap is an issue for society. Um, the conversation seems to be held by half of society and not all of society. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, we, we, we heard from um, Libby earlier about the power of if the closing the gender pay gap, having more women in your workforce increases safety, there's an incentive to do this. Has there been any studies that anybody knows of of male champions that show that being a male champion might actually be good for your career or other things that might incentivize more men to get involved in this conversation and to champion? Um, and, and any other ideas about how we get men part of this conversation? And thank you to all the men who came tonight. <laughs> I'm not aware of studies. Um, I, I can comment on um, what I see as the popularity of the Male Champions of Change program. Um, it's certainly, I think, it's far exceeded the expe expectations of, of those who established it and there are more and more uh, male CEOs or male chairs that want to be a part of that. Um, it's a vexed issue within... Um, women's um, groups that I'm involved in. There are some people that uh, think that they pay lip service to the issue and it's more about being seen to be doing something. And then there are others who have the view that um, you can't do this on your own and you need to um, ensure that, um, if, I, if I use sort of the more traditional language, you, you need to ensure power is on your side in order to make the structures available for you to be progressed, women to be progressed and for the strategies to be put in place. Um, I'm just brutally pragmatic about these things. So uh, if it's working, then I think that we should embrace it. And uh, what I see in, in those workforces that where we have male champions of change is that there is, uh, there is leadership that, um, that results in change behaviour. Uh, and there is a, um, a strategy, it's usually transparently communicated, uh, that those within the organisation can hang on to and um, use a common language in discussions around performance appraisals, um, recruitment, pay negotiations. Uh, so I think it is a force for good and um, we have to find a way to always make sure that this is an inclusive conversation. The benefits of gender equality don't go one way. Mm. Um, and we particularly see this when it comes to uh, caring responsibilities. Mm. Um, the, the benefits for all of us, uh, parents, children, um, grandparents, in being involved in the care of others are enormous. Um, and employers will reap the dividend of that as well. So shifting that attitude in particular will be key, I think, in um, bringing about a reduction, if not closure, of the gender pay gap. Um, I am aware of, I think there is some sort of positive correlation between male CEOs having a daughter or a son and being a greater advocate for gender equality. So I don't know how we how we act on that. <laughs> but, but there is, I think there is some specs of data out there. Um, I think we'll, we'll uh, looking at the clock, um, we're very appreciative of everyone's time tonight. If you've got further questions, please feel free to, to linger um, and speak to our panellists. This has been just a magnificent conversation. It's taken us um, through a whole gamut of, of um, issues to be addressed. I hope that we've um, 
we've fulfilled the mission of both looking back at history, but also walking out of the room with a greater sense of some insights and purpose and where we can go in the future. Thank you everyone for your attendance tonight. Um, and thank you for your support of the Women in Economics Network and the Economic Society of Australia. Um, and the various activities that we do. And thank you to RMIT for sponsoring tonight, especially the diversity and inclusion team. Thank you. Great.